Okay, well, why don't we get started? I'll call a meeting to order, seeing the hours after seven o'clock. Call master plan committee meeting of uh, July 16th to order. Um, we have uh, four items on the agenda tonight. First one's update and status report. Um, I see Fred's uh, online here. So maybe Fred can give us a quick update of what his committee is doing. Oh, first I should say, welcome Mike uh, Ray's back to the committee. Mike's taking Don Van Dyne's place. Uh, Mike is uh, a seasoned veteran of the planning board. So I'm sure he'll be uh, great input. So Fred, you're, you're on. Okay, okay. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, I'm Fred Brusso. I'm co-chair of the Age-Friendly Chelmsford Initiative. And to bring you up to date as to what the status is, the, the core team, the age-friendly core team, really hasn't met since February. And, uh, but uh, we've been active in continuing our age-friendly initiative. Back in March, we sent a draft of a age-friendly action plan to the UMass Boston Gerontology Department. We did that, uh, our seven domain teams had put together a first draft, a very good first draft of the action plan, but we wanted some, some professional help to take us over the finish line. So we sent the uh, age-friendly, our first draft of the age-friendly action plan to UMass Boston Gerontology Department. They've, they enhanced it, they embellished it, and they sent it back to us on the 30th of June in a, in a final, uh, final deliverable. Our domain teams are now reviewing that final deliverable to ensure that their comments have been incorporated. Uh, they have until the end of July to do that, at which time I will send that final deliverable enhanced by the domain teams out to, out to the 35 members of the age-friendly core team, including some other groups, your group, your committee included. I will, I will send you a copy of that action plan so you can take a look at it also. Uh, how we funded the uh, age front of the UMass Boston effort was Chelmsford was granted a $40,000 FY20 earmark from the state. We use a portion of that to fund the work from UMass Boston. The remaining funds which we've been active with uh, in the interim since February have been used to purchase various items from various departments across the town, the senior center, the fire, uh, fire department, the police department, the, the community services department, and the library. And we have just about expended the uh, $40,000 uh, in, in a well-deserved effort, I think, uh, uh, to enhance the uh, welfare of the uh, senior citizens in town. So that's what, uh, that's what we've been doing, uh, George. Uh, as I said, uh, when you gave me approval to send the, uh, the survey to UMass Boston, I had reviewed it. I was impressed with the number of responses and especially uh, the responses to question number eight, which was specific to the age-friendly initiative. I was also impressed with the number of extra comments at the end, something like oh, over 400. I'm, not, I'm still trying to go through them. Uh, but I, can, I could see from the, from the responses and the additional comments that the two high priorities from the respondees, from the respondents, were housing and transportation. And coincidentally, those are two of our top priority domains, housing and transportation. So I think going forward, uh, we might have an opportunity to work together, our domain team with transportation and our domain team with housing, to work with your committee to uh, make it an even uh, better product on our action plan and your, act, uh, your master plan update. So just to give the committee an uh, update, uh, Fred asked me about the, the survey and if it was okay to send it off to uh, the gerontology folks. And uh, I, I didn't see any reason why they shouldn't see it. It's, it's something that's a public record. It's something that um, it's helpful for the town and what they're doing is helpful. So uh, I asked them to make sure that they, that they didn't um, say that the master plan committee endorsed anything. Um, it just uses a reference material. And uh, um, so I thought that was appropriate to do. 
Um, so yeah, George, if, 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 if I could add, uh, yes, in fact, UMass Boston Gerontology Department was quite impressed with the uh, content. Uh, also, they, as I mentioned, uh, as you mentioned to me, I mentioned to them that I wanted them to ensure a uh, written uh, statement in the uh, action plan that the master plan update committee had yet to review the uh, survey and had yet to make any determinations as to any results of the survey. That is in, in writing in the action plan. Great. Oh, thank you, Fred. Uh, let the record reflect Nancy Airway just joined the meeting at 710. Um, we're on the first, first agenda item update. Um, uh, either Beverly or Evan, do you want to go next and give us an update where you think we are and where we have to head in the, in the direct next direction? So, uh, Evan, you want to go first? Uh, Beverly, uh, Beverly can start okay. us off. All right, like. Beverly, you're up. Okay. <laughs> um, so, we haven't met in, I don't know, six months maybe? And um, at this point, we have given you the uh, economic development section, the land use chapter. Um, we have a draft transportation chapter that I have to actually go through and edit, but it's pretty much done that we could provide for the next meeting. And then we also owe you the housing chapter. So, I mean, one of the things um, that Jay's on vacation this week, so he's not participating tonight, but he and I had talked about this project. And one of the things that he mentioned is he hadn't really gotten any feedback from the committee on the economic development chapter. So um, if people want to take another look at that and sort of refresh your memory in terms of what's in there and whether in fact um, you have comments on that section. Um, and then the other thing he and I were speaking about is um, the given the climate that we're living in right now, um, I, I'm fairly certain based on conversations with George that there probably will not be public meetings for this project. So it would be helpful to have a discussion about how it is the committee sees the recommendation piece of this evolving and how the strategies for the master plan will be formulated. Um, so, at this point, even the land use section is really just the technical data piece of this. We do not have recommendations even for that chapter. So that's really one of the next steps in trying to at least wrap up a section of this is putting together the recommendations section. Um, and Evan and I probably can have a little discussion offline about the what should go into the issues and opportunities and what he sees as the town planner and economic development director probably should participate in this as well. Um, as the, the things that are related to land use and zoning that need to be addressed in the upcoming years. So that's where we are with the process and with the sections that we're responsible for. And I know that the committee has met on their own to discuss the other um, sections. So Evan probably can speak to that because we haven't been involved in that part of it. Yeah, so to refresh the committee's uh, memory, on the non-NIMCOG meetings, we had uh, reviewed historic, cultural, open space, and recreation. Um, the committee wanted to keep all of the 2010 text and revise accordingly. Um, I reached out to the Historical Commission. They are going to uh, undertake a review and update uh, of their pertinent uh, sections. Uh, cultural we reviewed. I will make those edits. We also reviewed open space and recreation. I will uh, continue to make those edits. I believe uh, facility section uh, we have not uh, addressed as a committee. My expectation is that we'll likely send that off to uh, facilities, uh, DPW and, and the town manager to review and update accordingly. Hey, I, I wanted to go back to one of the comments uh, that Beverly made. Um, it's actually number three on the, the agenda. So I'm going to skip to number three. Um, 
the survey had over 1,100 on the uh, electronic and then another 100 mailed in, which I think were just being tabulated not too long ago. I don't know if we got those additions. Um, but I was shocked at the, the response that we got. We got 1,200 people to respond to the survey, and that's quite a bit. And I think that, uh, as Fred had mentioned, there was an awful lot of comments in there. So I think it's, to me, that's almost better than some of the public input sessions that we had. Um, you know, it's a matter of us deciphering through it. But, um, you know, if the committee so, so thinks that we should have a public input session at some point, that's fine. My thinking is, is that we continue to move forward, get these sections done, and then have another public input session when we have a rough draft of, of the product. But, you know, whatever the board wants to do, and I guess we should have a little discussion on it, um, as far as where, um, where we see it should go from here. Um, public input at this point, uh, I really like doing things in person because the way we, we've done them in the past, um, these public input sessions is, you know, they, they uh, people, we do a SWOT analysis, they put out the comments and then they go out and they rank them with colored dots, important, least important, that type of thing. And then and they get tabulated. Can't really do that on Zoom. So, um, well, I think for as long as the COVID thing is around, we can't really do that at all because you can't have people standing so close to each other and handling the same materials and all. Um, so, if we were to have a public session, we'd have to sort of rethink how we would do it because there's still the requirement to keep people six feet apart, and you can't do we put in colored dots on flip charts and be six feet apart. Right. That's, that's part of my thinking was, is if we go to uh, um, a public input session at the end when we have a rough draft, then people can be sitting apart and make their comments, we record them, then we go back and discuss them. Then, um, But it, that's my opinion. So I'd like to hear from the rest of the board members on your thoughts. Um, so I guess I'll start with Nan because you're one of our senior members on the board. There you go. Uh, so I think we do need public comment, but I certainly appreciate that we can't do it with a public meeting. Uh, and then the question becomes, how do we do that? Um, I, I'm kind of thinking we put it out there on the town website and solicit comments um, as opposed to an interactive session. But I do think that we need to have some some mechanism to get feedback from the public before this goes uh, to a uh, anything near a finalized version. So I can talk a little bit about how some of our communities have been handling uh, public sessions for documents. So a few of our communities are involved in the MVP process and they've had to present their MVP plan and their hazard mitigation plans uh, at a public meeting. So they have done it on Zoom. And they've basically scheduled them as part of a planning board meeting. And basically, there's a PowerPoint presentation that they provide. Um, people can, there's a, there are sort of breaks in the PowerPoint where people can ask questions and provide comments, just as Justin had described when Georgie signed on with people being able to raise their hand. There's also a chat function on Zoom where people can just type in their comments if they don't want to speak or they can type in questions. All of that input gets saved. It's just like we're recording, we can save the chat comments as well and everything gets documented there. And from the state's perspective, that is the way they're recommending that we handle these things. So that would be a possibility for this master plan as well. And I will say, as strange as it may sound, what I am observing is that participation is actually much higher on the Zoom meetings than it would be if, uh, for a typical public meeting that we would have in person out in the community. Because I think people find it more convenient. They don't have to leave their home. If you have kids, you don't have to find a sitter. So it there, and frankly, a lot of people have much else to do right now. So it it has been fairly successful. So the question is, at what stage do we have that? Is it a stage that we get to somewhat of a rough draft with with uh, um, uh, the uh, 
issues and opportunities and the recommendations and then uh, let that become the discussion point or um, you know where do we what stage do we do that at is what what my question is I, I that we have a clean draft um, perhaps not not certainly not an expectation that it's a final draft but a clean clean draft for presentation that we would go forward with and wouldn't be ashamed to go forward with um, my feeling is that taking anything that is uh, truly, you know, a temporary or a, a half half done document to the public is just asking for trouble. Um, right, right. I, I agree. I think you're yeah. saying is that if no one commented on it, we'd be proud to present that to town meeting, to the planning board, to the yeah. board of selectmen. So, so That's I, right. I agree. So, uh, so, let, the so let the record reflect Joe Reddy has joined the meeting at 719. So we have had uh, some planning board meetings with a, a fairly large number of uh, public participants, you know, in the in the 20 range. Um, I've also done some classes lately with UNH that has been using Zoom um, and uses the chat function for continuous feedback, and it's working. Um, it's actually a very manageable uh, input method and you know i have to say it it keeps the public comments succinct okay as opposed to 20 minute dissertations all right let me move uh, on to bill your your thoughts on this you want to unmute bill hold on bill gotcha Is okay now yep gotcha yeah, I didn't, I didn't mute myself, so I thought I wasn't muted, but okay. Uh, can we not do it this way like we're doing today? Is that not possible? Or you have too many people participating to do the in-person thing over the computer rather than, than doing it. Can we do that? I don't, I don't know if that's possible technologically. I think Nancy and Beverly both said to do it with the Zoom. You know? I mean, can, can, we, can we do that if, if 200 people want to attend? Is that is that do I don't know if it's doable. I have the slightest idea. Um, Telemedia has a license for I believe up to a hundred people to participate. Okay. participate. Okay, so so I, I I mean I don't I you know I I would I I would hesitate to guess as to how many people would be interested, but as some of you have said already, I was shocked at the uh, the, the level of response we got. And reading through all the you know the number of people that responded to the survey and the number of people that took the time to write their priorities and some in some detail so it could be that maybe more than 100 people would be interested so i don't know how to handle that so okay. well what you could do i've not had a public meeting where there's been more than 100 people in any community i mean i've had i think the most i've seen is about 52 in one meeting which i thought was still pretty good attendance it's more than you would typically get out in the community at an in-person event. So if you suspect that you're going to have a large number of people like that, you can require that people basically register to get their Zoom link so you have a sense of how many people are going to be interested. If, if there's overwhelming interest, you can divide it into two nights if you wanted to as a way of okay. allowing everyone to participate. But I don't think you're going to get more than 100 people. Okay. And uh, past history, uh, dic past history dictates that we've had somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 70 or 80 people on the high end. So, but that's, that's people that get in their car and drive to a place. This is much easier. So I don't know. Okay. Good point. Uh, Scott, your thoughts. Um, basically, I agree with you and Nan, um, and, and and even um, Bill that coming up with a clean draft would be the appropriate thing to put forward for public review. I'm kind of struggling with the numbers, like Bill. If we had 1,200 people interested, to enough to their opinion, I think they'd be. Part of a lot of the comments were, you know, how do we get sort of get more involved and, and get access to more information on how to make access to information easier. And I think 
this might be an opportunity if we could come up with a way to do that. Zoom sounds like an answer, but if there's a limit of 100 licenses, um, we might want to schedule, you know, as I don't know, five sessions. Uh, okay. Depending on, I think uh, Beverly's pre registration was a good idea to at least get an idea who's interested. So the only, the only uh, caution there is that people can be required to pre register. Um, but what you, what some communities are doing is in addition to putting it on Zoom, they make the meeting available um, on their local cable site too. So people can't, they can't participate by putting something into chat, but they can at least watch the session and give them information on where they can email comments or submit comments if they're interested. Well, that's a great. George, can we coordinate something like that? So um, I'm sure we can coordinate something. And, and uh, one of the thoughts I just had that crossed my mind when you mentioned that is maybe we have public input on particular sections because maybe someone that's interested in housing is not interested in economic development or, or something else. And, um, and if we think there's going to be that many people. so. Um, We'll have to put our heads together and try to come up with a plan for that. But I think the final draft or a, or a draft that we could take final that's clean and then present it to the public for public input is, is the bottom line. But um, let me go to Mike and then I'll go to Joe and for their comments and try to get everybody's opinion. So uh, Mike, you're up. Okay. Well, um, I won't comment on exactly what form the uh, uh, the document should take, but I will comment that I've been to uh, Zoom sessions with well over 50 people in them, and uh, they've gone just fine. They're eminently doable, and if the license uh, that we have access to uh, is only good up to 100, and we really thought we'd get more than 100 people, uh, you can get a license um, for more than that. I think you can get a license at 500, and I think you can do it on a one event basis. So um, we can certainly handle a lot of public uh, in this environment. If we do, you might want to uh, have somebody who's very, very familiar with, uh, uh, with Zoom actually uh, managing that aspect of the meeting, but. Yeah, it won't be me. Yeah, well, no, you get, <laughs> get somebody in the background. One of the guys from uh, uh, the TV channel can probably do it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. Joe, are you with us? I am with you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just working at the same time. So my thoughts are I can't think of a better opportunity than now to roll out um, doing Zoom for – these meetings because I think we talked about this in the past where we were hoping to do it but there was really more open meeting law type issues if we did it that way so we couldn't and you know this is probably the wave of the future so from a master planning perspective that's probably a really good thing um, and I think having participated in a number of large zoom uh, platforms like we did the Russell Mills from a tennis club and we had probably 90 members that were on that zoom call and it went perfectly you know it wasn't overcrowded people a lot of people show up just to hear the information they don't necessarily feel like they have to input which i think is good um and it lets them feel a lot more connected and a lot of people that are parents with kids that are kind of the fabric of the future of the community they may not be able to make an in-person meeting whereas if we do it on zoom they will and i think if we run one and it just gets way too overcrowded you know, at that point, we just try to run multiple or break them up into sessions, or we can even just go ahead and break them up into sessions in advance. Um, but I, I think it would be a good thing. And I do think we should try to have somewhat of a cleaner product before we put it out to the general public. Is that good? Okay. Um, Evan, do you have any comment? Are you, are you good? I got a thumbs up. So I think what I heard was, Let's get a, a good good draft together. We'll put it together. We'll put it out for the public for, for a public input. We'll hold a, a Zoom meeting. 
Um, best to have people register, then we'll have an idea of how many people um, that we have for the meeting and if it's gonna be an issue, if we have to break it up into another night, uh, we'll do another night. So once they, once they register, we'll know, you know, if we've got more than 100, we'll say, okay, everybody from one to 90, you're gonna be on Monday night and I'll, uh, next night or Tuesday night, the rest of them will be on Tuesday night, so. Um, Mike said, let me, let me circle back with uh, Telemedia to see about the one-time uh, purchase of uh, larger larger participants. Okay, all right. Hey, George. Yes, and Fred, I'll come back to you in a minute. And I'll go Nan next, Scott, then Fred. Thanks, George. Um, I think we should consider breaking up the chapters in terms of nights, um, because I think you're going to have participants that are interested in one or two chapters of it um, and not in other ones. And that in itself should limit the number of participants on a given night. Okay. All right. So we should think about that. Let me go to Scott and I'll come back to Fred. Scott? Well, my only question. Um... How are we going to communicate this to the public that we're going to do this? Because um, there were a lot of comments in the survey about how to how to how to be more informed, how to access information better, how to find out more about um, additional participation. And Zoom, I think, presents that opportunity. But I don't know that everybody has access to a computer. But if we can coordinate with the television broadcasting, um, that's great as long as everybody knows about it. Okay. Good point. Uh, Fred, you're muted, so there you go. Yeah, George, I'm, I'm new to the uh, survey process, but I guess I, I, I just want to ask a question about what, what would be the goal of the public input session? I understand you want them. I understand we need them. What you hear from the people attending the public input sessions how is that going to affect the results of the survey versus how are their inputs going to be integrated into the draft version of a master plan? Good question. And sometimes what happens with these public input sessions, uh, topics are brought up that the committee just doesn't think about or didn't think were, didn't cross our minds. So uh, then the committee will go back, deliberate, and determine whether it's something we want to add, adjust, fix. You know, uh, I think that's basically the way I look at it. Um, you know, we're only a seven seven member board. Um, we have we have excellent help with Evan and Beverly and yourself, but you know, sometimes you, you miss things or someone has a, a uh, an idea that they saw in another community. So. Um, and then we go back and we deliberate and, and determine whether we have to change something, or fix something. And I'll give you an example. And what the example was uh, on the last master plan, Chelmsford Street from 495 to Route 3. Um, the side that Moonstones is on is predominantly commercial. The other side is residential. And the neighbors came out uh, in the Westlands and they talked about it and it became very important to them that the residential side stay residential and the commercial side doesn't get to the point where it's, it's crazy, where it starts to expand into the neighborhoods. So, you know, that was input and we, we made the adjustment to the master plan to reflect one side uh, was, was residential and the other side was uh, commercial and it should stay that way. So, um, and that came out of a public input section. I don't know if that helps or not, but. Right, no, that does help. But in that particular example, if they had issued a survey before that public input session was, was held, the inputs you got versus the, the sides of the street zoning, that wouldn't have changed the results of the survey. It may have changed your thoughts about what to put into the master plan, but it shouldn't, I don't think, affected the survey any. The survey is a given uh, thing by itself. Yeah, it's, it won't change the survey is my, in my opinion, but um, you know, it's, it, we have to take the survey results and the results of the input and put it together and see if they all mesh, you know, and it all makes sense. Okay. Uh, all right, I'll well, that, but um, someone else have a comment? I was just gonna 
right? Part of the master plan is sort of the recommendations of what to pursue, uh, right. the steps to achieve the goals. And if we left something out, or we talked about increased uh, commercialization, that's when that uh, public input helped to clarify something specific about a particular area. So that's how it impacted the master plan. It, to your point, George, it wouldn't impact the survey results, right. but it could it could impact the recommendations that the committee puts forward in the master plan. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Okay, so the next item is a uh, survey results and discussion. Um, I had read through the survey. I made some comments. I forwarded them off to Evan. Evan sent them out to you. Uh, I don't know if anyone else had an opportunity to do the same um, and take a look at my comments. Um, Evan, you want to talk about it? Um, I'm wondering if either Justin or Beverly can share a screen um, using uh, Scott's recent email from around seven o'clock this evening. Is that what you're looking for, Eric, uh, Evan? Is this is this from Scott? This is the uh, survey results that I received. So that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So, so George, do you want to? go through your comments and then Scott can go through his. How do you want to handle the input? Uh, I, can, I can, I can, I can go through mine. I got them on the screen here because I can't see it there, but. Um, Why don't, can we, can we allow George to share his screen? Oh, I got it on a different computer. So don't ask me to do that. <laughs> All right. I, can, I, can <laughs> I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Let me look uh, for George's, uh, George's stuff. One second. So you, if I pull it up my screen, I could share it somehow. I have your, I have what you sent out, George. Okay. Let's see. Okay. All right, can you see that? Yep. So um. First comment I said, it, um, you know, it seemed like a good age range, um, you know, the, the lower end, the 14 to 25 is, I think, what we kind of expected. Um, so I thought it was a good mix, mix of ages. Um, second comment was the uh, uh, majority of the response have been in town more than more than 11 years. Um, so I think that was um, interesting um and then it looks like a community character the way i interpret community character uh, employment in schools the most important reasons people live in here i mean it's something that uh, um you know it goes back to that where we had discussions last time master plan was you know we're a, a sub suburb versus um you know, an urban urban area, a suburb, you know, rural settings. We had those discussions, so um, I just found it interesting. Um, on the next page, page two, where the comments are, there was one comment I found uh, interesting um, and worthy of discussion. Um, they chose the community because of character, low key suburban setting chance to stop being rural after so is complete affordable housing and crimes make chance to be right for developers now developing areas that violated violated zoning laws i don't know about that but uh schools are good teachers are dedicated library and community art center uh, we need to embrace our suburban not rural community and make changes to adapt to that i think that last sentence was a thing that caught my eye um you know so i think that was uh, something um but first, you know, I think an awful lot of people had an awful lot of comments about, you know, they liked it specifically because it was kind of more rural, kind of a yeah. simple 
prairie, a good place to raise kids. And, you know, um, you know, they're they're complaining about the traffic, so they they seem to like you know a small town community as opposed to more of a hustle, hustling bustling suburb. Um, I don't know. That's there were the comments were all over the map, but I saw I seem to see a lot that were really appreciative of a small town atmosphere. Yeah, uh, that's my next my next uh, comment was uh, recurring themes, location, community, character, neighborhood, rural feel, uh, but changing uh, and a lot of people coming back to where they grew up. So um, back to that that community feel. Um, you know that people like that more rural type setting more and they, they don't want to become in my mind a city you know I mean they don't want to have nothing but pavement they like the trees they like the grass so um, that was my feel out of that um, So we had um, discussions regarding recreation and it was based on the survey. Maybe we do not have a problem here because uh, that's a 7B. Um, you know, people seem, I, I took out of this, people seem to be okay with the recreation opportunities. You know, it's um, excellent is 18.3, goods um, 50.1. Um, you know, a lot of things on the high side and not as many things on the low side. So we talked, we had a lot of talk about uh, recreation director and recreation thing. So maybe we are doing a good job when we really didn't know that. So, but that was um, a pretty interesting point. Uh, 7C, uh, my comment there, uh, affordability seems to be uh, the, the biggest issue here. You know, people are getting priced out of the market. There's not enough affordable housing. Um, 7D, um, it basically transportation, it, it's, I wrote down there appears to be room for improvement all around. Question comes to place whether there's actually room for improvement. In other words, um, you know, can we make 129 into four lanes instead of two lanes? I mean, how do you do that? How do you, how do you find some of these improvements that need to be made? Um, I'm not sure if that's that's something we can do. We can't do all of them, obviously, but I'm sure there's some things that we can do, and I think the town has done some of those things, um, or, or at least trying to do some of those. Seven uh, C. I just um, it's in. Economic development, access to employment, availability. I just—it's indicative of the uh, of the location of Chelmsford. You know, at the crossroads of Route Three and 495. Um, you know, access to employment is good. Uh, availability and access to goods and services—you know—they're all high. You know, it's excellent and good uh, comprise 60 and 70 percent of of those two uh, points. Um, Um, 7F, I just said there's, um, looks like there's a little room for improvement in this, uh, this area. Uh, down to number 12. It's, uh, it was interesting. It says school building improvements, sidewalks and road improvements are high priorities. Recreation is on the lower side. Again, I, th I found that a little bit interesting because again, we had a lot of conversation about recreation. Um, some of these comments are more like my notes than, than anything else. So, um, So 12, um, see several topics, taxes, traffic, uh, overdevelopment, school maintenance, updates on buildings. Um, the thing that struck me was that, you know, a lot of people say updates to, to school buildings. I know over the years we've done 
boilers, we've done roofs, we've done windows, we've done bathrooms, we've done floors. Uh, I talked to Gary Persichetti, they have a list of all the things they've done. Um, you know, I think all the windows were replaced at the high school and, and McCarthy School. New roofs were done on McCarthy and Parker and, and, uh, and with the addition at the high school, the auditorium. Um, you know, a lot of the buildings are in fairly good shape. I mean, as long as we keep up on the capital improvement program, um, but I see people have some feeling that these buildings are old and they need a lot more work than, than, um, than the, there is. And I, I think that I like to get that report from Gary on facilities to see what they've done over the last 10 years and what the plans are for the next 10. I think it's, I think that's important. George, yeah. um, if there's any things that they requested that weren't funded, I mean, it's great to know what they actually did, but it would be good to know if there were things they were asking for that they couldn't get, wasn't funded. As far as I know, uh, everything was funded, or most everything's been funded. Uh, I don't think we've turned down anything in the capital project. We did several years ago approve, I think it was 18.5 million uh, for uh, improvements through, I think it was Johnson Controls to do energy updates on boilers and, and uh, thermostats and a number of different things, which in turn helps, uh, helped with uh, lower utility bills. And there was a payback period. I don't, I don't remember exactly how that worked, but. Uh, that updated a lot of the, the boilers and, and furnaces around the, the school buildings. So I think that I, as, as long as I've been a town meeting member, I can't remember that um, if something was dropped off, it was it was relatively minor. And wasn't I thought you yeah. uh, George, for oh. don't like what, what has been. I'm, I'm sorry, you broke up on me. I was saying, I think it's a problem where people just don't know what has been done and how much has been spent to maintain and improve. Right, and I think that's why I get in a report from Gary on what has been done over the last 10, 15, and 20 years and where what they have planned out for the capital projects over the next 10. Unfortunately, this year they had to cut back capital projects because of the shortfall uh, occurred in the last three months of having restaurants closed and, and hotels closed. Um, we lost those lo local option taxes, the three quarters of a percent on the meals tax and, and the, the local option tax on the hotels, which I think is more than that. Um, but it's hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and, and of course state aid is going to drop off. So, I mean, you know, so they did cut back the, the capital budget for this year. Uh, so that may have put some things in the back burner for now, but uh, George, do we think do we think we might do the facilities section? We're gonna, yeah, this committee is gonna do it. It's not gonna be with NEMCOG, but we're gonna do something with facilities. Um, okay. I think, I think that uh, Evan made a point earlier to have uh, uh, Paul work with his team to update that section, and then um, then we can work on it and, and maybe get that list of things so we can point out in the master plan what has been done and what's on the boards to do in the next 10 years or so, five, five to 10 years anyway. Um, so people can see that the town is doing a good job of maintaining the building. So, you know, I, that's, I think there's another comment here. This is, what, what additional services, um, Leaf pickup was one of the big ones I picked out of here. Um, obviously, affordable housing for seniors, rec facilities, um, school repairs, upgrade, food service, which the food service, they, they're updating a couple of uh, CAFs now. Parker is one of them. I know they've been updating the high school um, a little bit. Road and sidewalk repairs, um, which uh, I know that uh, with the chapter, I think it's 70, is it 77? They do, they do have a pavement, paving project and sidewalk project. 90. 90, 90, 90. chapter 90, so. Um, so. I think 
that's it. For the show. one more. And I just went over common themes. Number 13 was uh, schools, real estate, taxes, affordability of housing, seniors being priced out, overdevelopment in the center, condo development town, character in the center of the town, and lack of business in 129, which is all the things we've been talking about. It's nothing new. So. St. George? Yep. Um, somewhere in the survey, it talked about income. And I was kind of surprised to see 75% like of the respondents were making $100,000 or more. And what was it, 45% were making more than $150,000 a year income? Yet, yet there's an awful lot of comments about affordability, more public transportation, more assistance for elders, free breakfasts for veterans or something. And the, the people that responded, the 1,200, how comfortable are we that they're representative of the 30,000 plus that wants, you know, more affordability in taxes and everything else? If they're making $150,000 a year, what, what's going on here? How can you want more for free? I get you. I, I, that's why I'm just scratching my head going, maybe the people that responded that are making $150,000, I'm confused why they're asking for more affordability things. I'm, mm -hmm. Anybody? Yeah, I think there are a lot of people who, while they can afford it themselves, would like to see uh, the town be a, uh, a plausible place to live for a wide variety of folk. I mean, my, my personal gut feel is I want all the policemen, firemen, and teachers to be able to live in Chelmsford. And, uh, and I think a lot of people think that way. I like Mike's answer. I, I do too. You well, can't live hurt if you make $6,000 a year. I think one of the uh, other things is that some of these people even that have higher incomes may have grown children who can't afford to move back to Shelfsford and they'd like to have their entire family be able to live in town if they desired. I'm in an age class where a lot of my friends are concerned about the ability to retire here. So we're, we're at that transition phase where some of us are still working and some aren't. And, uh, you know, the incomes are good. They're all tech in incomes, but they're all saying, okay, but I can't afford to stay here if I retire. Um, and they don't really want to leave the home that they've had for the last 20, 30 years. So how much money do you need to live in Chelmsford? Well, <clears throat> depends what you want to do, but it's going to be tough on 60K. Yeah. If I may. Yeah, Fred. I understand the comment that 45% of the respondents make over 100K or 150. Well, that's 45% of 1,100 people. 30% of Chelmsford's population is over the age of 60. I would presume they're not making $100,000 or $150,000. So they're concerned about affordable housing and being able to live in Chelmsford in, in, in public transportation where they can't get around. So talking for the seniors in town, the 30% of us, uh, that's why we're after affordable housing and public transportation and safe roads and sidewalks. Well, I'm not disagreeing that we need that. I'm just confused by the 75% of the people that responded making over 100. And I'm just scratching my head going, how much money do you really need to live in Chelmsford? So the, um, the affordable housing plan does have a couple pages about how much income do you need to afford an average rental or an average uh, uh, sale price of an ownership home um, and it documents the affordability gap uh, in that. 
Um, if you read, uh, you read the, the Globe on a regular basis, every couple months, uh, there's uh, new studies issued on, you know, how much does it really cost uh, to live in Massachusetts as a renter or, or as a homeowner, and how much do you really need to make uh, to afford to live in, in certain communities. I will try to, uh, I'll work with Beverly offline and see if I can send you a couple of those websites. I believe Chapa may have a pretty good new website, I think. I think uh, Chapa has some, some good stuff and so does um, MHP. They have yes, MHP. Some partnership. Yep, they have some good information uh, too. You know, I wonder, uh, Beverly, can the survey results be isolated based upon the response, how many years in town and in income? Um, I Anybody? don't know, because I'm not really all that familiar with that software, but I can find out from my staff. Yeah, because I think, I think some of the questions that Scott's asking, you know, would be interesting to see the isolated, uh, how, how people who lived in town, let's say for less than 10 years, compared to how people lived in town for 25 plus, the same with income bracket. Hopefully but that's possible. Uh, with so basically the doing a, a cross tabulation of those two issues. I'm sorry? You're, you're looking for a cross tabulation basically of those? Those are the two that come to mind, but I'm sure there are others. Okay, I'll, I will find out whether it's possible to do that or not. I'm not sure. Okay. Is, are these, is this data currently in a database? And if so, can we get hold of it to it's, run our own series? It's in SurveyMonkey. So, I, we have a license for SurveyMonkey. It's not um, a software that probably most people you know, have on their computer. Mm -hmm. so. Are you able to export, export the, the results? Again, I have no idea, but I'll find out. All right. Okay. So Dan, Dan is itching to get the data. I am, you know that. <laughs> Well, I think I think you're just going to get you know sort of um, maybe not necessarily opposing input by by the new people that are younger versus the older people with more money or the older people with less money or how's that break out? Well, you might find out you might find out a couple of things. One is you might find out that that there's people have been here for 20 years. The kids now are graduating from college. They like to see the kids come back in the area and, and buy a house or rent an apartment. And they're finding out that the apartments are $3,000 or $2,500 a month. Our house is $500,000 and the kid coming out of college, you know, maybe he's making okay change, but if he's making 65, 70,000, 75,000 out of college, okay. he may not be able to afford a $500,000 house because he doesn't have a down payment and you know, he's got student loans. And then you got, like Nan said, people in that category that's, you know, they're making okay money and all of a sudden they're looking at retirement becoming fixed income. And all of a sudden, you know, the tax bills have crept up and the maintenance on, on houses creep up. So there's a, there's a whole host of, of issues that probably play into that affordability. And, um, you know, I see it with, uh, with my father who's on a fixed income and, you know, his taxes have crept up Now he's in law and his taxes have crept up and uh, his costs in his house have crept up and, you know, it's, you know, fixed incomes are fixed income, so. I also just want to say that <laughs> Chelmsford's a very um, fiscally conservative town. So even though people have money, they don't like wasteful spending. It's just kind of the, it's just built into the way Chelmsford residents are. So I think that's some of the respondents kind of attitude there as well. Even if they're making over 150, they're okay with spending money as long as they think it's prudent. Okay. Um, um, George, we, yeah. um, Justin now has the uh, input that Scott provided, if he wanted okay. to talk about that. Yep, Scott, you wanna go over your input? Well, I, I, I pretty much did when, as we were going through yours. I, I just kinda opposing, or my different views, not that they were opposing, but just different views on some of the material I read. Um, the first one there is 20% are the child raising age and 80% kind of have no kids. Um, not sure if it's a real reflection of everybody because I was, I was really surprised by the amount of people making over a hundred thousand and over 150,000. That's, 
And by the way, somebody coming out of college making 75 is doing pretty well. Um, 10% have less than five years, 20%, 10 years, 75% were here more than 10 years. So again, I think we're getting a, not necessarily a skewed view, but I don't, I don't know. Um, Scott, I can tell you that uh, the age is spot on. The number of years that uh, the respondents lived in town is spot on. And that's primarily documented by uh, the 2010 master plan and then the uh, 2017 um, housing plan. Okay. So those, those responses do reflect the data as we understand it. Income, okay. may be, income may be skewed based upon just the socioeconomics of the people who responded to the survey. And I just, yep, uh, I, I just couldn't figure out how they calculated the percentages on number three, what it was telling me. I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't make sense of that section. Beverly, are you able to clarify that? You're muted. I know, wouldn't you? Um, so I think what this is saying is that 60% of the, of the surveys that were submitted, there was at least one person 18 years and under who lived in the household. So it doesn't really tell you much, except what it does tell you is that you have a pretty good representation here of people with young members in their household and people with who are seniors. So you know you had more more families than seniors responding because there was a bigger percentage of people that have school age kids. So I think this okay. is when you look at some of the other the other information because. People's responses, particularly for the kind of um, open questions, are really tied to their personal experiences. So if you see a lot of people with children, you're probably going to see a fair number of comments about schools and um, recreation for kids and those kinds of things. And the same applies to seniors. So you want to have a good cross section of people who live in your community. If, if we had very few seniors, I'd be concerned that we weren't getting enough input from them, but we, we have gotten a fair amount of input. All right. All right. All right. That's a pretty good way to interpret those numbers. That's good. Thanks. I basically agreed with, with George on that. Um, why folks are here. This is great. It's community, I think. Um, again, I was reading a lot of the comments and, and there was a kind of a mix of they like the rural, they don't want more development. Um, they like a tax break, you know, uh, try to leverage the, uh, the commercial areas that we have today. So I, I, I thought folks are kind of pretty adamant that they kind of want to keep it a rural, rural setting, good place to raise kids, affordable. Um, to Joe's point, prudent with uh, capital expenditures. So I thought I thought it was generally a good survey, but I was just um, surprised. Maybe those people that are making that much money are two family, uh, two parents working, and that's why it's over a hundred. Beverly, are you are you able to um, compare salary? Uh, results to the most recent census or whatever the best available data is? Um, when Jay does the housing chapter, there'll be updated income information in there. Okay. So do, we'll have, do, you have any, do you have any sense as to whether people would have responded based upon household income or rever versus individual income? Well, I think that's how the question was phrased. It was asking about household income, right? So if that's the case, Scott, then if you had two, if you had two adults uh, yep. working, it'd be a combined income. So it yep. says, what is the total income of all persons residing in your household? Okay, so maybe in that perspective, it's 
Scott, what do you, how do you feel about that now? No, that makes that makes sense, right? It's um, a working, you know, raising a family with both parents working it seems to make sense to to make ends meet, right? Because it's not cheap to raise kids anymore, and especially send them off to college. Right, right. Yeah, and again, I'm looking at those numbers on number six. Uh, they kind of look spot on from what I recall. I mean, there was a, you know, probably 10% of, a little slightly more than 10% of the households do make, you know, a higher higher income bracket. And I think that's what the survey is reflecting. Okay, yeah. Uh, that was quite a bit. So, but look at the numbers of those making less than 75. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 percent of the respondents. Yeah, 15. you know, some of this, some of this may have to do with the, the the primary areas of survey outreach were social media, so, social media via Facebook, the library, the senior center, um, and then the age friendly effort. The fifth one was the schools. So. You know, maybe the lower income brackets uh, just were not exposed to it as much. I don't know. Lower income is a single household of seventy-five thousand dollars or less, and we we call that lower income. Yeah, I mean, fifteen percent. Yeah, Beverly, what is what is uh, what is the 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 um, census definition of? lower income, isn't it? A uh, household of four is less than 64,000? Well, we usually use the HUD numbers. Yes. Um, and I don't have them at the top of my head, but I think for a household of four, 60,000 sounds about right. Um, I'm working at home and that information I have yeah. is in my so office, but. <laughs> I'll work with Beverly offline for your next meeting, we'll get that that context for you. My, my point is out of 1,200 or out of 1,100 respondents, 15% make 75 or less. Yeah, I, I, think, I think this is probably a question that has, has skewed, it does not reflect uh, real data. Okay. I mean, if you're a minimum wage earner, Right, you probably make somewhere between thirty and thirty-five thousand a year. So if you have two people working in a household that are both minimum wage earners, you could have a household under seventy-five. Right, right, agreed. Okay. I don't know if it makes it right or wrong. I'm just thinking. I mean, it could very well be possible that, or even somebody just making you know, 50 or 60,000, but, you know, maybe the spouse doesn't work because it's too much for childcare and they can't, you know, cover the difference by going to work. So there's also that too. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, how much does it cost to live in Chelmsford, right? If it really costs a household where you own the house, or even if you have an equivalent rental, if the household income has to be 90,000, I don't know how we're gonna let seniors age in place. That's all I was kind of driving to. I mean, after taxes, it probably costs like 20 to 25,000 a year. I mean, I'm just thinking about like the Chelmsford Commons, which is where the trailer park is, just their park fees alone are almost $900 a month. Yeah. So the lowest, the lowest entry level housing to buy in Chelmsford in terms of single families is probably in the 325, 350 range. Joe, what's the mortgage end up at? It's about 2300 a month with taxes. And how much does somebody have to make in order to get a mortgage at that level? Um, you could probably make 75 and make that work. 
Okay, so 75 becomes the entry level to buy property in Chelmsford. Or, or is that does that apply to the senior aging in place too? Depends on the kind of senior housing. Well, it depends right. on how much of a mortgage they still have. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the comments that we've heard for a long period of time um, is that there isn't a lot of affordable, relatively affordable senior housing options. Much of what has been built is luxury um, and large and square footage. And it seems like increasingly the seniors who, who reside in town are looking for moderately priced and smaller size units. And unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of stock. We just don't have it. So when we when we did the North Campus Study Committee, I'm sorry, West Campus Study Committee, and we talked about you know 55 and older development. We talked about cottage style homes that are you know 1,200, 1,300 square feet for a senior. Um, they just we just didn't exist in town, you know, to make it more affordable. Someone that's that wants to downsize because the kids are out of the house. Um, because the taxes have gotten too high, the maintenance in the house is too high, and then right. you get them something smaller and it just wasn't there. Um, for them That's a good point, George. Uh, that, so. that, that committee's report, I think, directly reflects not only the, the residents' desires, but the data. It, it reflects the actual need socioeconomically uh, in Chelmsford. Unfortunately, that, that property is unlikely to be developed uh, in accordance with that particular vision. The, you know, I've been in to some of the properties over on Windermere and Meadowood, which is right next to that campus. And those units, and Joe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I've seen numbers like 450, 475, and then they have an HOA fee, of, you know, Wait, Which complex are you talking about? Windermere and, and Meadowood, Augusta. Yeah, those, are, those are all in like the five, 50 to 600 range to be honest with you and the problem with Chelmsford is like I've got people right now that are selling their house they want to go into a 55 plus community but like all the Windermere ones are all bigger than their house like they're almost 3,000 square feet they're all talking about downsizing and if you go up into like New Hampshire they've got a ton of like single level ranch homes that are like anywhere between 15 and 1800 square feet and you know, they, they meet their new lifestyle perfectly, which is kind of why, like, if you go into the farms, you know, a lot of times they consider actually just going into like a slab ranch, but the problem is they don't really want to take on the exterior maintenance anymore, which is why they're trying to get into a 55 plus community. So, I mean, I would think just take that with, with the North campus or whatever, or West campus, or that would be a perfect place if somebody built 55 plus like reasonable housing, not like some, gigantic place that people don't necessarily need the extra square footage. It does, that doesn't look like it's going to happen right now. <laughs> that's disappointing because that, that's really like there's a huge demand for that. Okay. Scott, you want to continue on with your comments? Um, sure. Sure. I think, I think we've got most of them, but we can buzz through them. I just thought when I was reading through this, I thought everything was good, but there was, I thought there was an awful lot of high in the inability to make a comment. So it seemed like a lot weren't using a, a lot of the service and they're generally, they were generally very satisfied with the public services in the schools, obviously not so much with traffic in the roads, but, but I thought it was a very positive thing to tell us. And it was interesting that folks aren't really using a lot of the services unable to score unfamiliar so i thought that was kind of interesting um generally i thought it was a, a great survey this was more about access to information which i was talking about earlier um and then again that the contradiction with the money and the low cost so i was kind of confused about that but 
maybe it's just uh, two parents working. But I, I agree that information access is huge. So. So I just looked up the, um, the HUD income limits for the Boston metro area while we were chatting for, they just came out in March for 2020. And for a family of four, it's $92,000. So it's more than you think. 92. Well, that's got working, right? Um, again, the only other, the only other comment I had I, I, was, you know, uh, what I read from all of this was great. I, I think satisfied and they came to Chelmsford because they wanted a nice kind of rural atmosphere. They want to keep a rural atmosphere. They want good schools. They're kind of satisfied with the public services. Um, and they kind of don't want any much, much more development. Um, focus on what's investments we got to go make and uh, try to keep our, try to keep our rural community uh, atmosphere. So I, I thought it was a great survey. It was, parts of it were a little confusing to me, but, but overall I thought it was a lot of good input. All right, um, Scott was the only other one that had comments. So um, I, I really like the, the rest of the board to go through and look at it, put your comments down, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to help the rest of us when it comes time to make decisions and, and, and talk about things on how everyone feels about what the survey, what they got out of the survey. So, um, so if you can do that, that'll be helpful. Um, Evan, you got further comments on the survey? No, I'll work with Beverly to uh, see if we can isolate some of the results. Um, and the reason I would, well, I'm hopeful that we can do that is, you know, to me, one of the themes is um, that the town's really not experiencing physical uh, pains, but it's really transitional pains where you have, you know, 30% of the population is um, senior, uh, senior age. And then you have this increasing uh, first time home buyer, younger uh, families that are moving in for the probably the same reason that people have always moved to Chelmsford. And I think that's the, that, those are the growing pains that Chelmsford is, is facing at this point is just that transition between the old timers and the new folks that are coming in Again, the irony being that I think both groups share the same uh, reasons for living and loving, you know, Chelmsford. Um, but um, I think where we're across is, is development. I think if you're an old timer, you view Chelmsford as rural or what being rural at one point. If you're moving here as a first time home buyer, you're likely viewing it as a, uh, a suburban, a vibrant suburban community with, with all the great services and conveniences. So that's why I think getting trying to trying to dig a little deeper and isolate how many years in town and see what the survey responses were, you know, maybe pretty insightful. Beverly, you got any comments? Um, no, I mean I think I think we had a pretty good um, response. So one thing I was going to try to do between now and the next survey is to take all of the open-ended questions and just kind of categorize the responses into themes. So that would give you a, a better perspective of what's in there. Um, it's, it's hard when you have pages and pages and pages of people's comments to really see clearly what the, the major concerns were um, and what, you know, what was just a minority of the people. That would be helpful. Uh, anyone else have any comments on the survey? Bill, Mike, Joe, Nancy? Okay. All right, so we've got to figure out our next item on the agenda, which is where do we go from here? 
Um, so, Evan, you want to give us your thoughts and then Bevel your thoughts or vice versa? I don't care. I mean, I think, I think we need to figure out how often the committee is going to meet. If we're going to go back to twice a month, once, one with NIMCOG and one with the committee. Once we figure that out, particularly for, you know, August, uh, then I think we can figure out what we can schedule for um, agenda items. Okay. Beverly, your thoughts? Um, we, we can certainly participate once a month. Um, there are a couple of days that aren't good for us where we have standing meetings. So I can give Evan a list of those. So it's basically our board meeting. And then we also have meetings with the uh, Kingsborough Master Plan Committee and with the Pepperell Master Plan Committee, although we're wrapping up in Pepperell, so that won't go on for probably more than a couple more months. And we'll be done with that project. When we were meeting back in January and February, twice a month, does anyone recall? We were meeting on Thursdays, weren't we? Thursday nights, second, yeah, second. second and second fourth four. Thursdays, I believe. Which ones? Second and fourth. So to Beverly, does the second Thursday of each month still no. work? Is it the second? Yes. For you? Oh, the first and third. I don't the, sec the second Thursday is the one that doesn't work for us. Um, I believe the third Thursday or fourth Thursday will be fine. I think it was the fourth Thursday we were doing. I think it was too. With, with NIMCOG? Yeah. Yeah. And then the committee was meeting on its own on the second Thursday? Yeah. Did we want to pen those in for August? So let me ask a question. Uh, Evan, the section that NEMCOG is not working on is a historic cultural recreation and open space and facilities. Correct. Do you think you can have something for on historic cultural for, an, for a meeting in August? Um, well, definitely can, definitely can have cultural done. We pretty much finalized that one. There weren't a lot of new edits or new comments. Historic, I'm waiting for the Historical Commission to do their review and update. Maybe it could be ready for the end of August. I'll reach back out to them. Okay. Um, I should be able to provide you the open space and rec final draft. So I, I can commit to cultural open space and rec. Okay. So do we, do we want to do that first part of August? Which would be the 13th? Or is that too soon? That's fine for me. Okay. So why don't we work on that and then um, the board members need to look at uh, the issues and opportunities at the last plan and what the recommendations were. And then we can tweak those. If you can get us the section, we can talk about those yeah, as well. We had, we, we had gone through issues and opportunities previously. Okay. So, so my, my task is to uh, kind of uh, codify what I heard, and then we'll okay. review it. All right, and then Beverly, August 27th. Yep. Yeah, maybe that, you can check and see if that works for you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that works. I haven't, I have to check with Jay. Um, so I'll talk with him on Monday and make sure that that works for his schedule, but I'm pretty sure that that will work. And at that, we'll, we'll talk about We'll figure out which section to talk about. Talk to Jay on Monday, what section you think can be ready. And then um, we'll talk about issues and opportunities and recommendations to that time maybe. Okay, so um, I can definitely provide you with the transportation uh, technical paper piece of this for the next meeting. And then it might be helpful if we can have a discussion on issues and opportunities and the recommendations for the land use section. And we can start trying to get a good draft of that accomplished. Okay. So, um, Evan, will you write that down and email it out to everybody so everybody can work on it between now and then? Okay. And, and Beverly, see if you can get that to us when, as soon as you can so we can work on it as well. Sure. 
Okay. Yep. All right. Um, do those dates work for everybody? Sure. Yeah. Bill's yes. Nan's yes. Mike? I think so. He thinks so. I'm nice. getting old, Mike. Huh? You're not sure. <laughs> no, I've got, I've got a bunch of I've got a bunch of stuff that's likely to get scheduled. All right. Uh, in August, and I don't yet know when. Okay. Um, Scott, you're okay. Looks good. Yep. Yeah. Joe. Yes. Okay. So we'll shoot for those dates, and um, we'll get things put together. Try to get it to us as soon as you guys can, and we'll start working on it. Um, Still doesn't hurt to, to read through that survey and get comments back as well um, to Evan and he can distribute it so everyone can look at what everyone's thoughts were on the survey. So, Anything else, Evan? Sorry. Beverly? I'm good. Fred? Uh, George, let me, uh, let me ask you this. When uh, we sent information to UMass Boston, uh, we included the minutes of a couple of listening sessions that the age-friendly initiative team held. One was transportation. Would it be helpful to send you those minutes? Absolutely. Because as you observed in a meeting a while back, our, our action plan goes into a much deeper dive than your master plan update will. And I think you'll benefit from uh, some of the uh, some of the responses that we got in those listening sessions. I'll send you those tomorrow. Great. And we'll get make sure everyone on the board gets that. Okay. Scott, anything else? Uh, the only other thing is, you know, is, is communication, effective communication, um, access to information. And we also talked about you know, uh, a review of the master plan like every two and a half years which would, you know, see if we're making progress on these goals and are there any updates or do does, has the mood of the community changed, uh, the priorities changed to, to, to make these visions a reality? Yeah, so that's going to be the implementation part of the master plan. We'll, we'll definitely get into some of those topics. Okay, thank you. Mike, you all set? Justin, you got any other, anything else? You good, Nan? Yeah, I have two things. Okay. Um, the first one I think is easy. Uh, could we get a copy of the West Campus report that was developed? It, it sounds like it would provide uh, useful information in terms of our housing situations. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, the second one is not so easy, and I, I guess I would call it a concern, and that is that it seems that COVID is being a game changer, and somehow we need to do an evaluation to the extent that we can of what the impacts can be expected to be uh, that impact our master plan. So somewhere along this process. And and no, I don't think it's easy. Do you have an example that kind of comes to Evan, mind? Evan, I don't. Uh, all oh. I can say is I, I definitely expect that there will be land use implications. Um, I would expect that there will be recreation implications. Uh, truthfully, I'm expecting that there will be implications to senior services. I just, I don't know what it is without doing a, a major brainstorming, but I think there's impacts to the master plan. Beverly, are your other communities referencing or inserting COVID at all? Um, no. <laughs> so, and I think part of the issue there is honestly, no one knows. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, something that you would be merely speculating on. I mean, everybody knows that it's taking quite a toll on the economy and on municipal budgets. Um, obviously, the whole landscape of how we live our lives has changed just in terms of keeping yourself and your family safe. 
Um, but nobody knows how long this will last for. So, you know, if miraculously there's a vaccine in six months or a treatment in six months, it changes everything. In the meantime, it, no one really understands the magnitude of this. I mean, you look at what's going on in the Southern states now and you can't help but think that some of the people travel, some of those people will, will visit here and we may have find ourselves with the flaring up again. We're dealing with sending kids back to school and who knows what that means in, in terms of um, sort of controlling the, the spread of the virus. So it's really a hard thing to look at from the perspective of a master plan where you're really looking at things from a much higher level and you're not really addressing public health per se or um, health services for people or even looking at the economy because honestly, we don't understand the depth of this, the economic impacts to this. I mean, every week when new unemployment numbers come out, there's been well over a million people every single week. But some businesses are opening again, so some of those people will return to the workforce. Other people will not be able to return to their jobs. And when you listen to economists, they basically say this is going to be a long-term problem, but no one is able to really quantify it. So it's, it's really a hard issue to tackle from a master planning perspective because it's new, it's untested, uncharted, nobody really knows where to go with it and everybody's taking it literally a day at a time to, to figure out you know, how, where we're gonna head and how we're gonna do it. Just a couple of quick comments on this. Um, I think uh, locally and regionally, the multifamily um, surge uh, in development uh, does not appear uh, to be hindered at all by those multifamily developers. Uh, we've heard that in Chelmsford and we've heard that at some of the uh, kind of regional forums. Um, on the office, um, I think that's where the market uh, all involved, businesses, uh, property owners, brokers are trying to figure out how to go about their business moving forward. Uh, Chelmsford is in the process of um, continuing some 129 work um, with the uh, previous Camoin associates who did the, uh, the fully detailed 129 market analysis. Initial indications are that this could be an opportunity for Chelmsford to um, continue to kind of uh, remarket the 129 area uh, as a uh, suburban office park with lots of space or more space within these buildings than an urban um, equivalent. So that's, a, that's kind of a concept that um, the EDC uh, working with Camoin will continue to explore. But I think for, uh, for Chelmsford's purposes, 129 is, is likely an area that uh, could be impacted uh, hopefully in a positive way uh, by COVID, but that remains to be seen. Well, what we are seeing is a lot of interest across the region for space for distribution centers. So in the, the age of COVID, there's not a lot of shopping going on in brick and mortar stores, but everybody's ordering online and there's a need to be able to, you know, logistically yeah. handle all of that, that shipping traffic. So for example, a former Raytheon site um, in Tewksbury and Lowell off of the Woburn Street interchange in 495, there is a proposal now to demolish the old Raytheon building and to basically construct a, a 750,000 square foot distribution center there, which would serve just Home Depot. So basically Home Depot product gets would get shipped to that site um, and they would fulfill orders, you know, basically trucks would come to deliver it to your house three or four times a week. And that's their whole business model. And it doesn't, it doesn't really generate that much traffic because they're not shipping every single day. Um, and the, the trucks are usually gone from the warehouse by like 6 a.m. So it doesn't impact peak hour traffic much. Um, but that really seems to be, you know, we're moving away from typical retail into that type of business scenario. 
isn't uh, uh, the Green Meadow Golf Course in Hudson, New Hampshire is in the process of being sold and it's gonna be a dis distribution complex, three buildings. Yep. So. Amazon? They didn't say who, but the person who's gonna develop it into, uh, I read it was three buildings that are gonna be all for distribution. So uh, the only thing I could think of was the big three, and that's FedEx, UPS, and Amazon. So, but who knows, you know, it's, but again, distribution side. But to Nan's point, I mean, you don't know how this is gonna affect the schools because now they're talking about keeping kids six feet apart. So how do you take the classroom and take 20 kids and keep them six feet apart? And, and then what I've been going through the last couple of weeks, how do the food service directors deliver the food to the kids because they're gonna feed them in the classroom instead of the cafeteria? You know, they, they're not even sure. They're not even sure how they're gonna do it. And, um, so there's, there's a whole host and they have, a lot of these schools have salad bars and the kids help themselves. Can't do salad bars. Anymore. So, I mean, there's a whole host of, of issues that could be with the schools. And, um, and now they're talking about the commercial market being uh, potentially uh, in trouble because of people working from home and companies are gonna say, we only need 25% of people in the office at any one time. So we don't need that much space. We can work from home. Um, so just, it, it, it's it's a reality, so, but I'm not sure how to quantify it, the master plan because it's so unknown. Let's hope by the end of the year they have that vaccine and they have a cure and, and we can go on our lives as as not the new normal, the old normal, but who knows? Let's hope. Um, anyway, from there, Bill, you got anything? Nothing to add. Joe? I'm good. He's good. I think we're all good. So we got a plan in place uh, for the 13th and the uh, 27th. So I uh, will take a motion to adjourn. So move. Mike made a motion. Second. Second by Nan. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay. Have a great night. Take care. Yeah. Thanks.